Okay. You, oh, these are really tough. Okay. So, I'll continue discussing uh, dynamics on uh, on modulus uh, modulus curves. But uh, last time I discussed the space, uh, which I called H a one to a k, and I want to stick to that now. So we discussed a few uh, problems. They're all somehow these problems are related to understanding uh, dynamics of certain flows, which they're all basically an SL2R action on the space of these were abelian or, oh, thank you, quadratic differentials with zeros or singularities of uh, order A1 to AK. And it, I mean, it doesn't matter that you can, uh, that all it matters is that uh, basically you are fixing the singularity type. And uh, so what I mentioned at the end of the previous lecture was that uh, basically there is a nice uh, structure on this space, which is a piecewise linear structure. And therefore, you get a volume form, implies a volume form, which is invariant again under the action of SL2R. There uh, on this space. And this space has a nice, I mean, in a way, it's as if you know the space. You know what, what it should be if you have an abelian differential. In, in a sense, uh, it's just enough to know the holonomies around certain curves. And the curves, I mean, you can start like triangulating your surface. Imagine these are the singular points. And then the space, um, basically a point, this is x, which is x and omega. And uh, the coordinates are basically the coordinate system that you are dealing with. It's like uh, you are integrating your form omega on a set of uh, basically homologically independent uh, curves. But, but, the, but things are a little bit tricky here. And that's uh, basically because you are dealing with a flat structure. Uh, and it has, I mean, the curvature is less than or equal to zero, but it's not strictly negative. It's, it's uh, basically what happens is that you can't, I mean, when you deal with geodesics, there are many issues. In, in, in many ways, they are similar to geodesics on negatively curved manifolds. The homotopy class of every curve, you can find a geodesic. And um, um, you can, between two points and any homotopy class, you can find a geodesic. But the problem is that sometimes uh, for the geodesic, it's, it's much better to go through the singularities. So. Maybe you are, at some point, you, you think you have a sequence of these surfaces, and this geodesic will suddenly decide that it's cheaper to go through another singularity and then move away. So basically, you can't quite fix these guys. I mean, the, the, the piecewise linear structure basically comes from the, uh, the behavior of geodesics and how they go through singularities, which is very complicated. And in some ways, even understanding uh, so the behavior of geodesics Uh, it's not simple. It's hard to understand. And um, in some ways, ways SL2R action even helps you say things about the behavior of geodesics, of geodesics not going through singularities. Uh, because it's true that if you move, if you start with an abelian differential and you just deform it a little bit, the behavior of geodesics could completely change. Like this cannot, maybe is not, not uh, I mean, when you take the limit, things can change, and the geodesic can become, you know, not a geodesic. Basically, it would be cheaper for the geodesic to go through another saddle connection. But the behavior, even though it's very uh, hard, it's invariant under the SL2R action, which is a, the good news. So whatever happens is that when you act by SL2, it's almost the only defo nice deformation that you have, which preserves the, the structure of the uh, geodesics. Like what th these kind of geodesics going through only two, saddle, two uh, singularities are called saddle connections. So, so we have a nice structure, and if you want the the action to be ergodic and the volume, so the volume is finite, the action is ergodic. You have all the nice things, but you have to do something that I, I think forgot to say at the end of the last lecture, and that is to look at the space uh, of uh, abelian quadratic differentials of volume one. 
And the volume is really the flat volume on C. I mean, you don't want to multiply the abelian differential by 10 and 1,000 and 10,000. Of course, the, the volume is not going to be, to be finite. So, and this measure would be SL2R invariant, and this subset, which is the locus of things with all volume wall, would be invariant under uh, all these things. And, uh, and uh, so the measure nu would be finite. And so ergodic for the SL2 action, even for the, so these are results of Veach and Maser. And uh, even if you, so there are two uh, subgroups which uh, deserve their own studies. One is the, 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 the action of the diagonal group, and then the other one would be uh, 1, 1, T0. So this is, I call GT and mu, mu T, sorry, HT. Uh, they both act, they again, ergodically. The, uh, there is no invariant sub, if every variant subset under this, this action or this action would be, would have either measure zero or full measure. And, uh, and moreover, GT acts ergo, uh, is mixing. So if, if you know things about uh, the dynamics of, say, geodesic flow on a hyperbolic surface of finite volume or a compact hyperbolic surface, you see that they have all the properties uh, that they have. So it's a GT is mixing again the result of Maser. And um, it's even, if you are interested in uh, understanding the dynamics of GT more, it's even um, exponentially mixing, which is a much, uh, I mean, somehow more difficult result, certainly. That's as a result of uh, Avila, Gozel, and Yokos for abelian differentials, Avila, and uh, one of his students, if I remember. Yes, uh, for for quadratic differentials, and uh, and somehow more general uh, case. I mean, also a different different approach, uh, which can uh, actually deal with more general case, uh, is done by Avila and Gozel. I mean, more recently, and so it's kind of things. Uh, so mixing. This is the general audience talk. It means that if you start with um, with two subsets, say, imagine A and B, which are measurable, it means that if you go G minus T of A, intersection B, and imagine things are, this is a probability measure, then mu tends to mu A times mu B. Things really, it's really mixing. It mixes things up. <laughs> and exponential mixing is something about how fast this thing happens. So, um, so the whole, the whole thing, it, so most of the things that we know about the, or a lot of things that we know about the dynamics of the geodesic flow, say let's just for now uh, talk about the geodesic flow, which is, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you why I call it geodesic flow. Ge this, the diagonal action, it's very similar to what happens on a, on a hyperbolic surface of finite, uh, I mean, volume or like compact hyperbolic surface. And uh, so remember that we had a lot of things which were, I mean, the, the problems that we had, they were somehow invariant under the action of SL2. Our problems were invariant under the action of SL2. If you could do it for GT uh, of a surface, then you could do it for the surface itself. So, so basically what you want to see is that what happens if you start with a surface plus the structure and apply the geodesic flow? Where would it go? What happens to the, so that means that we want to understand, so, so the orbits of, so what can we say about the orbits of GTQ, then Q is an abelian differential or quadratic differential uh, of a fixed type. Is it dense? Uh, does it go to infinity? So these spaces are so not compact. That's something that we discussed today more. And uh, <coughs> but it's a piecewise linear structure. So uh, you can take a compact set. It says geodesics that go to infinity, which means that they will leave every compact set. And uh, and uh, we see if there's any hope of saying anything about the, the orbit of a geodesic. Because that's uh, somehow, in some sense, it's a very natural, so, it's the, so there are nice things about GT. So one of the nice things is that it's a, it's a natural flow. It's kind of, you start with the Nabilian differential. You, for now, there's nothing about complex curves. So it's, uh, you start with Q, which is, basically on x and q. So you have a complex structure. 
uh, and a quadra holomorphic abelian or quadratic differential on it. And then you, you look at GT, GTQ. And GTQ will give you another surface. So a, a flat structure also defines a complex structure on the surface for you as a complex curve and say, what kind of structure does Y have? So you see, you can also project H1, A1 to AK to some MG where uh, G is so that 2G minus 2 is sum of AIs, but it's anyways, it's a surface, so it's the moduli space of a uh, complex curve of that genus. So, um, and the nice thing about, one of the nice things about GT is that there, GT is actually a, is very natural. It mean, uh, but what I mean is that the orbits of GTQ, when you project them to the uh, moduli space or the universal cover, which is the Titanic space, if you do the same thing. Um, uh, are actually geodesics with respect to with respect to a nice Sinsler metric, what is called Titanic metric. So so these are really geodesics. So if you think about the case of uh, the, the billiard I think, that you start with, with a square or a rectangle, and if you do glue it, if you get torus, but uh, then the moduli space will give you that. It, then, then you get to the case of M11, the universal cover is the upper half plane, and the metric will be the hyperbolic metric. So the Teichner metric in this special case is actually the hyperbolic metric. So in the very special case, it gives you the a hyperbolic metric on the upper half plane, which is a, and then this would be upper half plane divided by SO2 Z. Okay, it has some uh, cone points, but apart from that, it's quite a nice space. And you can, and then the, the, the behavior of the geodesics on, in this case would be the, basically the behavior of geodesics on, on the modular curve, basically. Uh, so, so things are quite nice there, uh, but, um, so you can, you can ask like how, so there's an analogy basically uh, between, so you, this, you have this space. Unfortunately, the projection is not so nice in general. <laughs> so you have the action of GT here. It's some kind of a geodesic flow, but, it, but the projection into MG is pretty bad. I mean, if you can, I mean, if you think about it for a minute, you see why it is bad, but it's, if you can even count the dimension, you see that it, it's not a fiber bundle. I mean, there's no, this map is not a fiber bundle. This is not a fiber bundle over MG because just the dimensions don't add up. The dimension of this thing is 2G plus K minus one, which is pretty bad. And the dimension of this thing is like 3G minus three. So in many cases, this has lower dimension and like understanding what curves will have an abelian differential with a certain type of zeros is uh, something not, not very, not very easy. Uh, or a quadratic differential of a given type is, is not, the projection is not nice at all. There are, or maybe one can say something about it, but um, certainly not a simple map to understand. Uh, but, oh, okay. Sorry, I was wondering if you could explain where GT does fit in, sometimes it is, sometimes not. I mean, sometimes you, you, if you, you are lucky, for example, you can take a billion differentials, all of them, like, this, uh, the, all the zeros are the simplest type over MG, that's the vibration, right? right? Over, if you have a 2G dimension of abelian differentials over MG, but not necessarily, no. The dimension can also vary, I think. Okay. Um, okay, so let's, I'll just give you a, the intuition. So, okay, so if you have K minus one, locally, K minus one point, and if you're abelian differential, uh, basically, the form is like this local coordinates. The form, the form is determined basically by holonomies around uh, the, the basis for the homology, which will give you 2G, plus, uh, basically, it's the dimension of the relative homology, <laughs> plus K minus 1. And, and that's a local picture. So one, if around every point, if you assume that these are really geodesics, then, uh, then basically, the, the one form is determined by holonomies around 2G plus K minus one. If you have a quadratic differential, if you have to go to a 
uh, ramify and cover, and you get 2g plus k minus 1, actually. But the sum of ai will be 4g minus 4. Uh, yeah, so it's the, the dimension uh, count says basically that the, the, this, the projection is not nice. But you have a geodesic flow there acting nicely, and analogies between this and the action of maybe geodesic flows on, say, hyperbolic, this is two, or negatively curved uh, manifolds, uh, finite volume, say. Okay, this is not compact because zeros can collide and uh, can have a non-compact thing. But so there's, there's an analogy b between these two, but unfortunately things uh, don't work so easily. One, um, uh, one problem is that even if this is a vibration and you are dealing with basically the cotangent, cotangent bundle of mg, which is a modular state of quadratic differentials, say whatever that, that is, it's just that the things are not orientable. Um, you have a, if you have a bundle over this, the problem is that this GT is a, a okay, you can just look at mg and the metric uh, for which GT is actually the geodesic flow, the Teichner metric, and I make this the Teichner space, which is the universal cover of the moduli space. This is not Gromov hyper hyperbolic. So the first thing is that uh, there is no negative curvature in, uh, in a moduli space with respect to the metric that we are discussing. Um, and the second one is even this is in some sense even positively curved <coughs> at infinity, close to infinity, and this is sort of Minsky. That basically says that close to infinity, it's kind of a product, it's like a soup no, uh, norm, the metric close to infinity, where things, uh, I mean, you can think about just mg norm, the modular space of curves, where certain curves get short. This is a metric um, which behaves like the soup of a, like a met soup metric over a product of some, uh, some uh, upper half plane. So it even has almost positive, uh, positively, po positive curvature in some sense. But however, uh, the good thing is that we'll see, uh, we'll discuss this a little bit. It's <coughs> so uh, it's not, um, so because it's just the pro, I mean, this, what he shows is that the metric is basically quite close to a metric, which is the, the soup met of, the, of, the, of the product of edges, yeah. I mean, yeah, but, but that's a rough statement. So it's not positively <laughs> curved in any, in any sense. It's not Gromov hyperbolic, and you can't quite uh, take care of anything. I, uh, by this, what I mean is that you can have two points. You know, what happens in the, in, uh, and, and two geodesics, two infinite geodesics, such that they, uh, Somehow you have pictures. Okay, being Gromov hyperbolic means that you have, if you have a triangle, you have triangles. Triangles are thin, and it's not Gromov hyperbolic means that there are thick triangles. <laughs> and it's infinity. But it's not. You can use things about negative curvature at all uh, when you're dealing with this. But um, but in in some sense, uh, on the other hand, our results of Forney, which says that this is non-uniformly hyperbolic. So the by, by which I mean that the problems are only uh, at in, in the non-compact part of the space. And basically, like if you have a geodesic, if you have two geodesics, if, if you look at a triangle, you want to say, oh, is the triangle thin? Which means that every edge is close to the, uh, uh, the union of the other two, edge, the two edges that we have. It's, it's almost true if, um, I mean, it's true if the geodesics spend most of their time in the thick part. So basically, whenever you go to the, thin part of the space, you lose the uh, uh, negative curvature. But in the compact part, things are OK. But, but maybe we will discuss this a little bit. Uh, so, so maybe uh, I'll see, let's see. Say. So the, unfortunately, this is not true. But still, you can say a lot of things about, uh, about <laughs> behavior of geodesics. And maybe as an example, so that example of known results. One, one would be a result by, let me remember the, so these are from the 80s, basically. Um, Kirchhoff. Okay. 
Smiley and Mazur, for example, that says that almost every direction, if you start from x and q, and you just look at the, the action by rotation, uh, as if you act by uh, theta, so I the theta times q, uh, I, I, I write here the flow is ergodic. I, I'll explain what I mean. So if you start from a point for almost every direction, so there's a na natural S1 action on H12, and for almost every direction, basically the geodesics uh, don't go to infinity uh, straight up. They, they come back to the compact set. If, if you fix the compact set, they come back to this compact set infinitely many times. And this, this has a nice applica application that is because uh, this is from for every x, that means that if you start with a rational polygon, it's one of the questions that so we had in the beginning. Before I compare for every x, for almost yeah. For almost every theta, every so fixed every x. x. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so almost every is, um, so this is an S1 action and the Lebesgue measure on S1. And actually they show that the Hausdorff dimension of the bad guys is less than or equal to one half. <laughs> uh, yeah, but if you start with a rational polygon, this is an example of something you can get just by looking at the geodesic flow, even though the geodesic uh, flow is not as nice as, uh, I mean the, the orbits are not as nice, but you can show that basically if you start from a, from a rational polygon, so this theta actually corresponds to uh, the angle of a line on the surface. And, or, and it means that for almost every theta, if you start from a point, if you look at the theta and look at the foliation that we discussed, which is just the foliation by straight lines, and you start and uh, go around and play the billiard, for almost every theta, uh, what happens is that um, your flow is the, the, the flow of the billiard flow is ergodic. So what can happen is that you can have a, of course you can have a closed loop, but closed loops are very small part of the picture. You can have a, 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 a generic thing, not only, uh, not only you won't come back, you will become dense, and actually what it implies is that for almost every theta, uh, the flow is ergodic, and, and therefore a billiard path will become dense and actually equidistributed with respect to the Lebesgue measure on the on your table. So, but unfortunately, there are so the, so there are examples like this that you can do by looking at the, the action of the geodesic flow on H one. But unfortunately, there are all sorts of pathological examples you can come up with. So there are, um, so examples of, uh, one can construct examples of uh, paths, for example, which are uh, uh, dense, but not equidistributed. So the Lebesgue measure is in some sense for, for the billiard flow is not ergodic. And um, so, um, and um, yeah, and so in terms of the H1 case, <coughs> even if you want to just look at Mg and the orbits of the tight mirror uh, geodesic, I mean, the tight mirror geodesics that you have on them, <coughs> you can come up with basically there are uh, geodesics going to infinity uh, for all sorts of reasons, very slowly, for example or very fast, or for, for, for no good reason. <laughs> and they, they are, so it's very hard to control um, the set of, and, and it can happen for almost a Hausdorff dimension half, even for a point x when you rotate the thing. So there's no way to control what geodesics will come back to the compact part uh, and which ones don't, which is kind of, say, different from a hyperbolic surface with cusps. <laughs> um, okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, they do they? Sorry. 
Uh huh. Oh, oh, okay, yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I think there are things you can do. Yeah, uh, yeah there, there, there are a lot of very interesting uh, things about rational billiards they can do just by even, even just looking at the, the, I mean, the action of the geodesic flow, even finding, uh, I mean, maybe I should also mention now that we're talking about the 80s. <laughs> uh, the, okay, so also finding, uh, so there are, and also this mm, uses the SL2 action, but I mean, uh, uh, you can sort of avoid it or not talk about it, uh, not talk about it in this kind of, in this language. Uh, there are closed, um, there are closed orbits, and the, the basically points with cl closed, like the orbits, which are the billiard paths, which are closed on every rational, uh, rational billiard. And uh, so that goes back to uh, Mazur, and and not only that, he what he proved was that the number of uh, closed billiard paths. I mean, the classes, as Peter pointed out, uh, uh, less than or equal to L uh, on a fixed rational uh, billiard is grows um, quadratically in L. If the, the length is the, just the Euclidean length of the, uh, that you have on the billiard. <laughs> Sorry? Uh, um, uh, I think it's both technical and it's a different thing. <laughs> but I think there are examples. I don't. I think they know that it's less than or equal to one half. What is known, and then uh, Yit Bo Chang. I think she show, he had an example of this one half uh, being achieved at, at the billiard, which actually sort of looks like this. Even you can analyze a playing billiard. I mean. Look something like this, and this is uh, one minus lambda. This is two. This is one, and see, uh, and see in this for the billion uh, for the quad a billion differential that you get by this, which is a genus two surface. Uh, for what theta is the thing is ergodic or not? But then he found out that even for this example, it's quite interesting that you see that the house dimension of like you can see the house dimension of theta if lambda is nice. The house of dimension of theta satisfying uh, not not nice theta is like house of dimension one half, but I don't think it's a very they know, I don't think there's much known about the general thing. It's what, when the one half is achieved, but but it's known that one half is achieved. Yeah, some, at least even maybe the higher genus is not. It's just an example. Uh, it's not less. Yeah, sometimes it's not less than one half, but. Um, uh, it's a technical deeper thing, I would say, I, but but it gets yeah. Um, okay, but um, so so maybe I'll say yeah, so this is also a result of Mazur, and um, then later Mazur and um, Eskin actually showed that for a generic. Um, and this also uses the action of SL2R and uh, a lot about the geometry of these abelian or uh, quadratic differentials. Uh, that for a generic point in, uh, okay, I, I have H1, but I, I, a quadratic or abelian differentials, it doesn't matter. For a generic point, uh, the number of closed geodesics, what I call regular closed geodesics, so regular closed geodesic is a cylinder uh, on an, a, a, say, a billion differential, which means that you have a geodesic which doesn't go through the, uh, any of the singularity. So it's, one, I mean, it's, it's just a flat piece there sitting on your surface, which is something that doesn't happen in a negatively curved uh, surface, but it happens on a flat one. Um, so, but and there are a lot, there are infinitely many of them. So finding, a, for example, finding a closed loop on your billiard is the same as finding one of these flat cylinders on your abelian differential. And the number of them, actually, they showed that um, uh, of length less than or equal to L on, say, Q, on a generic point Q, 
uh, grows actually it has a, the asymptotic which is c l squared and c is a function of so c is the c of the constant on h1 a k and and they they know exactly what c is in terms of the ratios of certain volumes of c is a as always rational multiple of a power of pi <coughs> and this we can write it as in terms of uh, ratio of uh, volumes of uh, some other uh, moduli spaces. But, uh, and this doesn't say, the problem is that this doesn't say anything about the rational billiard because the rational billiard is not generic in uh, H1A1 to AK. So they show that for almost every point, you have this, but the rational billiard, the union of all rational billiards in, a mod in the thing has measure zero. So <laughs> maybe it's not true for those. Uh, here's an example of the proof that they think about. Mm -hmm. that, that one, that one uh, uh, I, OK, so, so what happens is the example of which, OK, so for all SL2 R invariant, maybe I, sh I uh, OK, so so I'll take. Oh, okay, uh, may maybe I won't get uh, to talk about that, so, so maybe I'll prefer to say something about it for a few minutes now. So what happens is that um, the, the, if you start with a pentagon or any regular n-gon, the SL2 orbit is a surface. Uh, the SL2 or the closure of the SL2 orbit is actually one of these so-called beach surfaces. So understanding, uh, so you can get the constant in terms of the, volume and the, you know, basically Euler. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> so basically it would be something about surfaces. So then you get, they get the constant. Yeah, it's related to hyperbolic surfaces. So yeah, so if this constant is, is not necessarily the same as this constant, but say these constants are basically constant, <laughs> the same for all uh, points in a SL2R invariant set. Measure. I mean, so it's a related question. So here you're saying this is true for a generic thing, but you don't know. Is there any example known where the constants are actually different? Uh, I think that's my question. No, I think the, the constants are not the same necessarily. Yeah, okay. But they are not the same, but they are constant along SL. But maybe you, you, you might ask, are there countably many constants? Or like, how would the constants uh, vary? I mean, it's possible that the, you know, for, for what they had actually, that for, for a generic point in Q in, they can replace this by a measure mu, which is invariant, as opposed to the Lebesgue measure of this, invariant under SL2. So it's constant on the orbit. Yeah, it's so constant on the orbit. Uh, so the, the deeper absolute mu that you make, that <laughs> then you know. Uh, yeah, but I mean, I don't know if for different SL2 invariants, it's necessarily the same. I don't think, uh, it, it can jump. But uh, wait, 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 I mean, actually, this is not quite the right question. Is it true that for every surface there is some constant? I mean, uh, no, 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 no. This is this is this is actually still open. No, no. You need to know more about the SL2 action to get that. There's something that we don't know, actually. But okay, so we will. Um, but but for example, if you are on a beach surface, which happens when when you start with the uh, like a, po a regular polygon, that's for every point in that because on a hyperbolic surface, the dynamic is, is quite well behaved. Okay, so so these were some examples, but maybe I, I uh, so it's from the geodesic flow, but I want to spend a little bit of time saying a little bit more about the dynamics of the geodesic flow. Um, so, and this, uh, this analogy. So even though um, it fails that there are two issues with uh, this, one is the, um, I mean, this maybe they are related, the, the fact that these are not gromov hyperbolic and the, the related thing is that the space is not compact. But in the compact part, if you fix the compact subset, so basically the dynamics would be very similar to the dynamics of uh, uh, the geodesic flow on a negatively curved manifold. But uh, that's hard to, that's hard to do. And maybe I should also say that the non-compactness of this is very difficult to, un I mean, it's something quite complicated. For example, <coughs> if you, you're dealing only for, with MG, so the non-compact part is the locus where you have short geodesics. But it's kind of 
<coughs> you can handle it because it's quite a short geodesics. You have the Margulis constant somehow on a hyperbolic surface. Short geodesics are disjoint, so uh, very short geodesics. And you can say, okay, the locus where these are short, the locus where the other ones are short, so you can handle it. But what happens in this flat case is that you can have, if you try to compactify it, you can have subsurfaces disappearing. So that's pretty bad. Like you can have a surface, or you start with a surface of geodesics two, and then at some point there is not, I mean, this can't happen in a, in a hyperbolic uh, or negatively curved thing that, you know, always you have the subsurfaces can't disappear when you are going to infinity. But in this case, you can have, you know, some small triangles here, and the area of this piece can go to zero. So if you try to take the limit, you can just lose part of your surface, or even most of it. <laughs> so you try to compactify, you end up with almost nothing. So that, that causes serious issues. But on the other hand, closed geodesics <coughs> on MG, or on basically if you have a closed orbit of uh, the GT action on H1, is something quite nice. Um, implies, uh, it'll give you basically uh, an element of the, maybe this is more like a remark, the Y, I mean, it's like um, a closed geodesic on the modular surface. I mean, the, the length has some nice meaning. And the same thing happens here, that if you have a closed geodesic on MG or that, that lies in one of these H1, A1 to AK, this gives you a, uh, so if this is on MG, this gives you a self diffeomorphism of uh, SG, so an element of the, if you know, the group of, uh, the mapping class group of SG uh, up to isotopy. And the, the length of this closed orbit with respect to this, I mean, the length is L such that G L of Q is equal to Q, or if you have a closed geodesic, the geodesic length with respect to the metric that is discussed has a, would give you somehow the complexity of, of uh, this, so this I call phi of phi. And what do I mean by the complexity of phi? It's that if you have a map phi from SG to itself, it's a self diffeomorphism of SG to itself, and it choose any metric, so this goes back to Thurston and I don't know, maybe some other names here. Um, that that basically the entropy, uh, topological entropy of the, or if, if you want to look at, uh, I mean, you don't want to talk about entropy, you can say this can start with the Riemannian metric, say D on SG, and start with this curve, closed curve alpha, and then look at phi alpha, and then phi k alpha, this length uh, L of phi basically sh tells you about the growth, growth of length of phi k alpha as, as, as k goes to infinity. Basically, if you have, if you take log of these and divide by k and uh, let k goes to infinity, uh, you get the length of this, which is the geodesic length on the moduli space. So this is somehow the dilatation of this element of the mapping class group. It tells you the complexity, it says how the, if you iterate the, if you start with the surface and iterate this, the, the map again and again, the length basically, the length of any curve that you choose, closed curve that you choose, will grow uh, by this factor roughly as k goes to infinity. This group becomes like e to the length, uh, e to the l, which uh, is something that would have in the hyperbolic setting too. Okay, so. So what happens in the, if you go back to the, uh, the case of hyperbolic uh, surfaces or say negatively curved manifolds, you can look at the set of closed loops that you have. Now the closed loops with respect to this, the, f the flow uh, GT that we have. And you want to see if it's similar, um, if it, the behavior is similar to the behavior on a hyperbolic manifold of negative curvature. And then the, and this here, 
I guess this, these are really uh, also old results and very interesting ones uh, about counting them. You want to say how the, the asymptotics of the number of closed geodesics of length less than or equal to L on a hyperbolic surface, then maybe a negatively curved manifold. Maybe this is, these are compact or not. Uh, and it goes on. And of course, and Margulis the, did this with um, negatively curved manifold. Uh, I think the compactness assumption was there uh, that the, uh, the number of closed geodesics of length less than or equal to r grow like e to the h r over r. And uh, r basically, h, or the main term is e to the h r, and h is basically the entropy of the geodesic flow on this manifold. And, and there are a lot of very interesting work that I won't have time to discuss about generalizing this to, OK, non-compact, not even the finite volume and, uh, and other things, and how you have these kind of growth behavior. But negative curvature, I suppose, is kind of necessary. Uh, and the important thing, uh, um, kind of maybe from at least Margulis, maybe I'll say Eskin-McMullen, which is it, they did something a little bit different. But I mean, somehow using something similar, using mixing of the geodesic flow. And it's very important that the negative curvature is important in the sense that uh, you, ha you, you need to have a kind of a notion of a stable, unstable manifold. And you, you need to know that things get, when you go to infinity on the stable manifold, things get close pretty fast, <laughs> something we don't have uh, in our setting. But um, so OK, maybe I want to mention a few results about the, the modular case of abelian differentials and the action of the geodesic flow. Um, and something very similar happens uh, here, even though we don't have the same, uh, the same tools. But we have, we have mixing of the geodesic flow. Negative curvature is not there quite in the non-compact part. And, um, and the, the non-compact the, the non compact part is quite uh, complicated. And something else that also happens in this setting is that if you start, you can also you have a surface. You can start with a point x. And instead of looking at closed geodesics, look at the, if you, you can also look at closed geodesics going through a point x. Uh, I don't know, go around and come back. Or in the universal cover, you can start. So if you have a group gamma, and the universal cover is Maybe here is H2, but HN or whatever the universal cover is. You can, the, if, you, if you look at the, if you pull back all the closed geodesics going through X, basically you are getting the elements of the orbit of X under the action of gamma. And you can count the number of closed geodesics going, closed geodesics, but not, I mean, it's, an, uh, it's a closed geodesic from X to itself. It's not a closed geodesic. As a, it's, uh, the angle here is not, ne not necessarily 180 degrees. Um, so, so this guy maybe will go to this loop. You can take uh, the, the, the count the number of lattice points. That is, take you have a metric here, and you want to see uh, the growth of the number of g's such that the distance between or maybe gx the difference between x. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. That's a better y. Maybe this is a y, and and even maybe you can take from <coughs> x to y. You can take geodesic path between x and y. It can be the straight one, but you can also go around and come back. Y and g x is less than or equal to r. And what happens is that these will also the number of these will also grow exponentially, and um, you get. The constant depending on x, constant depending on y, and uh, an exponential term depending on r, e to the h r, where r. But uh, what happens here is that you can basically do the same things, at least for the whole moduli space, before you get into abelian quadratic differentials of a given type. You can do the same thing, and the same results hold. And even something quite interesting happens that here, if you start with a manifold which is uh, um, 
and H again is the entropy of the geodetical. If you start with the manifold, which is negatively curved, but not the curvature is not constant, the constant depends on X and Y. And if, if the curvature is constant, then you can imagine that all the points are roughly the same, and uh, you see X, see Y, you can, you can get an expression for them, and it's, it's sort of, it's constant. It doesn't depend on the point. And okay, so maybe I'll say a couple of theorems that it's kind of, just kind of justifies the analogy, even though the, the steps for the proof are, that could be a little bit different, that the same thing happens. So at least for the lattice counting problem, uh, just to work with Rhea of the special. And that, uh, so given x, so this would be in the universal cover of the moduli space. Uh, so the number of y's such that, okay, distance between x and gy is less than or equal to r, it actually grows the same way. And uh, we come, uh, moreover, this constant uh, is, is really constant. can write omega squared. <laughs> so that is omega x is equal to, is independent of x. Um, oh yeah, a h is uh, h is 6g minus 6. But I, I have h for some reason that you see, uh, yeah, independent of point. So as if um, when you do the lattice counting in Teichmann space, it's as if it's a constant curvature manifold. It's the, the constant in front of the thing that doesn't depend on, uh, doesn't depend on the point that you have. And this is a, Corollary of the result by David Dumas, actually. No, no. Um, so you use a mixing of the geodesical. Um, no, there's. Mm, it's very, yeah. This uh, no, I think the error terms, so maybe with using, I think it's. it's no, we, uh, there's no error term for now. I mean, unless you can use the exponential mixing, and even that, I'm not, I'm not yeah, claiming it. Uh, yeah, this is to be yeah before exponential mixing. But even knowing exponential mixing, I would say that uh, there could be some technical things. That it's not an uh, you have to be a little bit careful about these balls because the metric is quite um, yeah. Uh, there could be no, no. The error terms are at least for now n not there. <laughs> And the, the, the uses mixing of the geodesic flow. There are the is, there are issues with the uh, these things. I mean, it uses results of Forney about the non-uniform hyperbolicity of the geodesic flow. But if the issues are non-compactness and not having the negative uh, curvature. Yes. Yeah. It's you know, this is more like the uh, uh, following the ideas of Margulis and using mixing, and uh, still. I mean, there, there are nice things there in the analogy, and that is the, the stable slash unstable manifolds are quite reasonable, are nice. That is, if, uh, in, for, the, ty for the, the action of the Teichmuller geodesic flow, but the uh, problem is that they are not really stable and unstable. <laughs> it's all, there, there are nice submanifolds which pr play the role of stable and unstable manifold, and almost everywhere uh, they are stable and stable manifold, meaning that if you start at two points, the two, the, if you go along the geodesic flow, the points get closed exponentially fast, but sometimes they don't. So um, it's, uh, it's not so. I, I don't know how to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not. Uh, yeah, I'm not. But you. But you. I. I, I don't know if the se the techniques will. Um, yeah, the, because the negative curvature is not there. On the other hand, maybe I'll mention now that it's kind of even though the negative curvature is not there, the uh, you can uh, somehow only deal with the compact part, which is negatively curved, and that's part of the um, reason some of the the results hold. And, um, and, and the counting of closed geodesics, that you get the same result again, <laughs> even though you don't, you're not dealing with the same setting. And the theorem would be, OK, 
Okay, so this is with Eskin and in general uh, for, uh, maybe I'll explain this uh, in graphy. Uh, it says that if you want to count, but this is a special case of the problem, in the number of closed geodesics uh, less than or equal to r would again grow like e to the hr uh, over hr, which, which is something that happens for negatively curved things. And I, I should say that cases of this were also obtained by, by proof by Ursula Hanstadt. Um, but somehow this is, uh, this is not the, the actual result, which is interesting. So, uh, so the problem here is, again, the non-compactness uh, non of the space. And something quite interesting happens that I would like to discuss a little bit. Uh, that is. OK, sure. Which one? Oh, oh OK. For every x and y, uh, g is an element, uh, so g is the orbit is similar to this case. So you have y, and you look at g x's. g is an element in the mapping class group. Or you, if you want to do it in the moduli space of curves, you have, uh, so this is the moduli space of curves. You have x and y. And you look at all the geodesics from x to y. So actually, what happens is that in every homotopy class, there's a unique geodesic. So you can go around here, maybe here, and then go to y. You can go here and here and go to y. So, and these paths are actually um, basically in one-to-one -one correspondence with G, which is an element in the mapping class group. So you have an action. It's very similar to this. It, H2 is replaced by the, up, the Tychner space. Gamma is replaced by the mapping class group. And uh, X and Y are two arbitrary point, points. And you start from Y and look at all the GXs. And you want to see how many points, how many orbits, this is a lattice counting uh, problem, how many orbits of y, x they are in a ball of radius r around y, and how that, that grows as, as r goes to infinity. So it's a little bit different from counting, uh, it's a bit, and it's easier than counting uh, closed geodesics in the case where uh, you are dealing with some bad, non-compact space in a bad way, because the, if y and x are fixed, your geodesic will come back to the compact part, which, is, which contains x. So there's no, it's, it can't be so bad. But maybe I want to discuss something about the. Uh, lava is constant. And I don't know what the, how to calculate it. I mean, we, can, we know we have a geometric. Um, it's, constant it's constant along the, the space. Independent of x and y, yeah. I mean, if first you prove, we prove this as a function is bounded, and we show that it's a bounded function of x, and then it happens, it's just constant. <laughs> and you just, but, but, the, but the way you show it, it's constant, is that this has a character, this has a meaning, it's volume of some ball in some space, and then then there are results, but David Dumas is a uh, recent results of him. And then you can combine that with something to show that this is constant somehow after the, after the proof of theorem. I, I don't know how to prove that directly. This is usually if the curvature is not constant, the different points behave differently, I suppose. But uh, yeah, but it, it seems that here it is. In the trivial case, the genus 1, uh -huh. one Yeah, yeah, because it's, yeah, but, but so genus 1 with one puncture, you'd say that it's OK, hyperbolic. So Hyperbolic surface, so it's constant curvature. So the yeah, case, you know yeah, yeah. <laughs> at least in one case, you know, that's true. <laughs> yeah, that's that's uh, okay. So maybe I want to say a little bit about uh, about the second theorem, and and maybe the theorem I would like to rephrase it. Um, uh, basically, I want to say that an H here uh, now. Is, is not 6g minus 6. It could be in h1, a1, ak. And h is um, 1 plus the dimension of this space divided by 2. Uh, and this, uh, this extra 1 is this normalizing this thing. This basically is 2g plus k minus 1. Uh, so it's, it's the entropy of the geodesic flow there. And what happens is that geodesics uh, are forced to go back to the thick part. Uh, 
th there are some recurrence properties of, of geodesics for the geodesic flow. And the statement, um, you can um, somehow, it's a stronger statement would be that basically given epsilon, uh, or basically given delta, there is this epsilon, and uh, C epsilon, which is a compact uh, part of a uh, compact subset in H1, A1 to AK, satisfying that the number of closed geodesics and theta is a number. The number of closed, okay, I mean, it could be closed or you can do it for the lattice counting problem too, of uh, length less than or equal to R, spending theta percent of their life, okay, of uh, the length outside of C epsilon is less than or equal to uh, e to the h plus delta minus 1 r. So the one spending even like 1% of their time in the, in the thin part, very thin part depending on, so uh, yeah, depending on, so it's, this is, you, it's not completely H minus one, but it's basically H minus one uh, would be the number, the, the, gro the growth of the number of the guy spending a certain percentage of their time, sorry, <laughs> uh, uh, outside of, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's a, the one spending all of their time would be E to the H minus one, but the, the, the one spending even like 1% of their time spending in the, thin part will be much, much smaller. I mean, with exponentially smaller. And I want to say uh, something about this. I think the <coughs> and even, okay, maybe, uh, and this H is the same H. And even if you start from, the same thing happened for the lattice counting. If you start from X and Y, so that's the same thing. Uh, and you look at the number of uh, guys uh, gy, distance of x gy is uh, less than or equal to r. Um, but so one thing is that the instead now I want to say something about something related to so these are in the Teichner space. So these are in something in the universal cover x two gy. But I want to say the ones spending um, their time basically in h. 1, A1 to AK. So that there exists X prime um, in, so the ones which you can find X prime and GY prime, that the geodesic, um, I, I write it X prime, GY prime belongs to H1. and spends theta percent of its length in, uh, in some C epsilon, outside of C epsilon. Again, is less than, uh, uh, okay, so I, I write something that depend on G, depend on X and Y, and then again you get E to the H plus delta minus theta R. So, so even if you, if you want to get things which are spending most of the time in the thin part of an, like some abelian differential of a certain type, you, you get that there are exponentially less of them. And this H is now not, now, not, uh, now not 6G minus 6, but half the dimension of this space, which could be even like 2G as opposed to 6G. And I guess I don't have so much time, but uh, let's see. Let me tell, tell you a few words about um, see, uh, so then so the idea uh, again, um, I guess goes back to Margulis and it's used in a paper by Margulis, Eskin, uh, <coughs> I guess I have to say, Eskin, Margulis, Moses, and also used by uh, Jayadev, Atreya, and, uh, and also 
by Maser and Eskin. Um, is, a, is a very nice way of proving such results. If you want to say that, and it's an I mean, idea that it, in, in every setting, maybe you have to spend a lot of time proving, uh, using this idea, but it helps a lot. And that is um, somehow, in some cases, even if the com non compact part is quite complicated, there is some force uh, pushing you back to the compact part. So what do I mean by that? So if you can find, so here's uh, this type of statement that you, if you have, you will be able to get these kind of statements for the number of like geodesic spending time in the in the uh, in the thin part of your space. But it's, it's very general. But you have to come up with the right function and prove the, the statements uh, in order to use it. So imagine that there exists a function I call the g of my space. Uh, Maybe it's a, I call my space MG, but it could be anything. And it, it goes to infinity possibly. But what happens is that if you are at one point X and you take ball of radius and you're, you're dealing with a metric, this is the Teichner metric, but it doesn't matter what metric you are dealing with. If you're taking ball of radius R and you're just saying, okay, maybe the reason this happens is that when you go to the thin part, you have less and less choices to follow to make your geodesic. And that you are overcounting in a in a really uh, in an unbelievably uh, uh, I don't know naive way, but but it doesn't matter. At the end, you get still get exponentially better than the, the ones coming back in the to the compact part. So maybe what happens is that if you start, um, so I want to say that the number of options. So I I replace the space with a net. And following a ge instead of following a geodesic, I'm just following the element of the net. Basically, these are points that O of 1 apart, that every point on the space is O of 1 apart from one of the nets. And instead of, I'm looking at the random path instead of a geodesic. And of course, I can backtrack and, and all sorts of things. It doesn't matter. But every geodesic would give you a path along this net. And maybe what happens is that if you are at a point x and you take the sum uh, of g of y, which y is a net point in dr of x, divided by, I, what here I call e to the h, maybe I should put this tau, h tau, so this is the ball of radius tau, this is the length of your step. If you take the average of g's um, in the next step, that you can get whatever <laughs> options you have, this is less than or equal to g of x, so it's like a subharmonic function, times um, e to the minus tau. Um, so basically, this if um, if x is very thin, by the, which I mean, this means that this you are in a very thin part of the space. So so basically, it says okay, if I just try to go randomly and just keep track of this function g. If you, if, you, if you were lucky and g was 1, that, would be, that means that the next option, you will have much less options than before. But even if you have a function g which is proper, it means that uh, at, if you are in the thin part, the average of the function, instead of being, if it's constant, it would be, the average of the function would be g again. But instead of g, it's exponentially smaller if you are in the very thin part. So the, the geodesic is trying to spend time in the thin part and going, going, but each, the further it goes, the more the force pushes it back to the thick part. So somehow, uh, so this is the, but of course, I mean, and you can apply this, art, this, this idea in many different settings, but the problem is finding G satisfying this condition. Once you have this, if you can find a function G, such that the average overball of the next options is exponentially smaller than the value at the point whenever you are in the thin part, you can basically get uh, almost, I mean, that would be the, it would help you a lot in getting, uh, showing that there are very few geodesics spending even half of their time or, I don't know, 1% of their time in the, in the thin part. Uh, but maybe, unfortunately, I don't have time. Yeah. 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 
yeah, you have less, but I mean, you just have to, there's a, either this, uh, you can find this G or not, and then it, it, you have to come up with the, the right uh, function and prove it. Yeah, it basically is something that blows up. Or you can do it even, right, you can do it, I guess, <coughs> even inside if you want to say that things don't spend so much time close to the subspace. Um, you can find a function that blows up there, and the closer you get, the more the thing will push you back away from it. So that would imply that if you can find the right function and prove the right, this inequality for it, it implies that um, the random path won't spend, I mean, the, 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 the number of the random paths spending like 1% of their time close to this space will be exponentially smaller than the yeah, number of random paths. Right? <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, it's in the quotient. Oh, this g is uh, basically 1 plus the product of 1 over the length of the shortest, the length of the short curve on x. And the, but you have to prove it. <laughs> yeah, it's similar, but you have to prove it. The proof is not similar. Yeah, you basically, it's basically, yeah, it's, it's almost the distance is 1 over, yeah, the length of a short curve. It's something that blows up when you go to, but then this, and the same function works even if you work with this h1, a1 to ak. But you really have to, in order to prove the inequality uh, for basically for h1, a1 to ak, you really have to understand the geometry of flat surfaces. It's something, it's not a very general. So, so where does this half of h, h where does two things is h plus? h plus, so yeah. So Oh, yeah, so that's just the, so the number of closed geodesics uh, of length less than or equal to r grows like e to the h, um, hr. So that's the, just the entropy of the yeah. space, yeah. So the, so what comes to the. No, the half is just the dimension of the stable manifold uh, at the point. That's just the, uh, but, but then proving it, you have to, I mean, you have to use that this H is basically the dimension of the relative homology with respect to the fixed points. And I mean, you have to just do accounting. Basically, uh, yeah, you have to approve a counting result, which is of this form. Is that, maybe I, I wrote it even here. You basically have to prove, uh, uh, yeah, such a result. The ones going from close to x to close to y through uh, an abelian differential, which is of uh, which has singularities of type a1 to ak, it actually grows. The number grows like gx, gy, and this is the same g actually, e to the h plus delta minus theta r. Because I mean, maybe I should I should mention that that so Teichner has a theorem that says that if I if you give me x and y, so it's Teichner's theorem. That makes uh, Teichner metric somehow interesting. There is a unique way of, there's a unique geodesic between them, which is the best, uh, basically the, and, and the quadratic differential here, which is the best way, the, the cheapest qual in terms of quasi-conformal factor, way to go from x to y. So, so these x and y are not conformal, but there are quasi-conformal maps between them, and the best way to go from x to y is to start from flat structure at x, so these are exactly the ones we discussed, the flat except for singularities, and, and then they are, they are copies of C, and in each C, use the GT part, so change the charts on the, the surface into, so the square will become uh, a rectangle, you squeeze and stretch, and this is a quasi-conformal map, and there is a quasi-conformal map sending x to y, like this, and the, uh, the transformation is exactly the thing we, we talked about. And the interesting, interesting thing about this is that given x and y, it gives you a1 to ak. Because, you, and you don't know how that varies. Generically, what you get is a quadratic differential and with simple zeros. But it's a, given, if you give me two complex structures, it, it gives you a drawing on x and a drawing on y, corresponding to the path from x to y, and somehow, the numbers, which are the, the, the mostly one, but sometimes not one. And these kind of results say that it's, it's really, there are less paths with uh, falling into 
other type of uh, quadratic differentials that you have the zero, which is something you expect in, intuitively, but yeah, you can also prove it. Um, but yeah, the, the, yeah, I think that's it. Next time I'll talk about the SL2R action. <laughs> okay, thank you. I see. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, so, so this term is, is this classical in the parabolic case? Which one? The one in front of you. This one. Yeah. Um, uh, for hyperbolic surfaces. Yeah. Mm, the so fact that the the, the ge I guess the I geodesic the spin. Some of them on that, that kind of like the curve Yeah. The up. Uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, but the problem is like saying that closed geodesics uh, spending like one, I don't know if this statement, I mean, it would be like if you have a closed geodesic and hyperbolic surface with, with, with cuts, then the, the number of the ones spending one percent, like all, all other time. I mean, one thing is that uh, it's not, you can, I mean, part of this is you can't quite make it in the, for a hyperbolic surface because in the cuts there are no, I mean, part of the, the why we were interested in this was that we wanted to count the number of geodesics spending all their time in the thick, thin part. There are no such things in a hyperbolic <laughs> surface, of course, that there are no closed geodesics in a cusp, but, um, but here there are. There are examples actually uh, constructed by Rafi and Hamstad that there are a lot of geodesics spending all their time in the thin part, as because the thin part here is really complicated. There's a lot more geometry here in the thin part than in the cusp region. The cusps are really like this. They are geodesics spending all their time in the thin part, but what we wanted to say was that those ones are exponentially less than e to the hr. It's not like there are more geodesics in the thin part than they are in the thick part. But, uh, but I guess the statement that geodesics spending half of their time in the cusp, they are exponentially less, I guess. It's m yeah. Mm. Yeah, I think it's, uh, yeah. If you are formulating the Fermi of the system, you look at each of them. Mm -hmm. So you can only, you have only a finer statement about the, the restricted process in each of the different uh, I, I, I don't know. You can feel it there as a uh. kind of a time. <laughs> oh, the, uh, um, so I'm not sure. Um, yeah, 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 right, yeah. No, I'm not sure, actually. I, I don't know, yeah, but I'm not sure if that, uh, I mean, one thing is that even, so these things are definitely related to exponential mixing. I mean, the exponential mixing of the geodesic flow, but this doesn't imply exponential mixing, and exponential mixing doesn't imply these. Uh, but uh, but I don't know if they, uh, no, I mean, I, I don't have, uh, I, but I haven't thought about that actually. Maybe there is. Um. Oh. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, but. Yeah, so uh, I think. Oh, well, well, Peterson, everything falls apart. So the problem <laughs> is that the volume of ball of radius oh. R uh, is infinite for the Vail Peterson metric. What? Volume of ball of radius R, if R is a little bit big, is infinite in Vail Peterson oh. metric. Because it, uh, yeah, it's kind of, uh, yeah, it's non complete, <laughs> and not, I mean, and then the volume is infinite. If ball of radius r, so it doesn't make, and then there are infinite. I mean, they you can go and spiral around the things a lot, and they, so all the the problem for the Vail Peterson is that is finding the right question. <laughs> these things would make sense, but the methods are sort of um, 
so but it, but yeah, I mean if so f um, yeah, there are thing there are distance functions which are not quite metrics that th these things might work for, but uh, yeah, I don't know if if there is a for some other metrics. I mean, it's kind of the the idea is 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 very general, but making it work really depends on the metric. Really depends on the geomet flat geometry of of abelian and quadratic differentials and uh, but for other metrics um, if, if you have a favorite metric that uh, that you suggest I, I think it's uh, it, some of the ideas might work but definitely the proofs would be very different um, uh, yeah but the wave coefficient is the most natural one which unfortunately doesn't um, make sense to, to talk about any of these questions there but the, but, the, but the idea of this recurrence thing, I think, appears in many other people's work, and it's, it's sort of it's very useful to have such things. And maybe I'll discuss some of the things next time.